Let us pray. God of life, open our ears to hear your voice. Open our hearts to be touched by your spirit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. How often do we give someone a chance to be reconciled? When a person has hurt us, harmed us, stolen from us, or simply not met the criteria we have set for them, what does it mean for us to offer to them a second, third, or fourth chance to be in relationship with us? How often do we insist on our legal or social rights rather than extend a hand of welcome and reconciliation to someone who perhaps has done something <coughs> wrong? Paul's letter to Philemon is one of seven letters the scholars all agree were indeed written by Paul. It's one of the shortest of Paul's missives, written not to a whole community as such as most of his other letters are, but to a small and particular group. Philemon is the head of the household. We often overlook that there's another group there, though. It's Appia, it's Archippus, and the church that meets in his house. So this instruction, while it's directed at Philemon as the head of the house, is very much addressed to the whole group who worship there and who are a part of his local church family, if you like. Philemon lived in Colossa, and scholars think that this letter was, lit, was sent from Ephesus to Philemon at the same time that the letter to the church in Colossa was sent. So Paul's in prison and he writes two letters. One that is to the much larger church across the whole city and then this smaller letter to a particular group. And, he, and this smaller letter to that particular group has pretty much one thing in mind. The letter is to accompany Onesimus. Onesimus is a slave, we discover, who has run away from Philemon's household, seemingly because he's done something wrong. Perhaps he's stolen something, perhaps he just broke something that was important. We don't know. Paul doesn't make it clear. All we know is that Paul offers to pay for any, anything that, any out of pocket that, uh, that Philemon might be in. We also hear that Onesimus has made quite the impression on Paul. Paul refers to him as his child, as one of his own heart. <coughs> so on the face of it, it seems simple enough. Paul sends the slave back to his owner and asks the owner to accept him. In a world where slave ownership was part of the social structure, it's radical enough that the owner would be asked to receive back a slave who had not only done the wrong thing, but had then run away. Paul suggests that he would rather Onesimus stay with him in Ephesus, but he didn't want to do that without Philip Philemon's consent. So again, Paul, in, in a curious way, acknowledges Philemon's rights as a slave owner. Philemon would be quiet within his rights to refuse to accept Onesimus or to have him arrested and punished. But Paul implores of Philemon, and remember, the church that meets within his household, something more than simply asserting his rights under law or society norms. Philemon is a brother in Christ, a co-worker for the gospel, and so is Onesimus. So Paul asks Philemon not just to welcome Onesimus back into his household as a slave, but as a brother, as a brother in Christ. Welcome him, says Paul, as you would welcome me. No longer as a slave, but as more than a slave, a beloved brother. 
In doing so, Paul completely upends any expectations Philemon or Onesimus might have had in terms of their legal rights or cultural or society expectations. Paul cuts across culture and class and insists that everyone be treated as fully human and equal under God, even this slave who has run away. It's a practical example. This letter, this plea to Philemon, is a practical example of what Paul teaches about in his letter in 2 Corinthians. Remember, in chapter 5, Paul writes, All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. Here is in Philemon, in the letter to Philemon, Paul is asking Philemon to put into practice that reconciliation to which Christ calls us. It's as if, too, that Paul puts one arm around his friend Philemon, and another around his friend Onesimus and says, this is how it works, drawing them together in the spirit of Christ's reconciling power. In describing the relationship that Paul hopes for between the two of them, he uses the Greek word koinonia, communion, fellowship, partnership. <clears throat> Welcome him, says Paul, as if he were me. Now, that's not to say that Paul's ignorant of the cost. Paul acknowledges the financial cost and offers to meet it. And Paul doesn't let Onesimus get off lightly either. I think it's quite clever that Paul gives Onesimus the leg to take himself. So you can imagine carrying this letter that kind of asks the person you've run away from to, to you know, welcome you. Onesimus doesn't get away or get, get out of having to face the person he has wronged himself. So my question for us this morning is how are we ambassadors of reconciliation in that holistic sense in, in 2 Corinthians in our own families and communities? Paul's example is of a slave who's done something wrong and run away. Of course, Philemon could have insisted on his legal rights and either sent an SMS away or had him arrested and punished. But it seems to me that that kind of legalism is evident in the way our community treats people. It's the sort of legalism that sits in the midst of the story of Nadez and Priya and their family. Family who escaped from Sri Lanka, who've legally been determined not to be refugees, according to law, but who are asking to be welcomed into the Australian community. Harder examples for us, I think, come in response to people who have committed serious crime. They're released into the community after serving lengthy prison sentences. How do we work towards reconciliation? And I wonder whether there are examples closer to home, in our families and in our church communities, <coughs> where hurt has been caused and people go their separate ways in the hope that the pain will eventually go away. Maybe, eventually, the pain subsides or numbs, but the wounds rarely heal. How might we be a community that offers one arm to the hurting and one arm to the one who has caused the hurt and bring them together? How might we also recognise that such breakdowns in relationship in Koinonia are really one-sided? We know that when relationships break down, when hurt is caused, more often than not, there's responsibility all round. 
and it takes all of us then and the spirit of reconciliation in Christ for the relationship to be restored. And it goes even further. So if by some, by the spirit of Christ we can, we can bring together our human family in the kind of reconciliation that Christ calls us, I want to suggest too that Paul's insistence on reconciliation in Christ is not reserved just for humanity. The letter to Philemon and his household is delivered at the same time the letter to the church in Colossia is delivered. And that's the letter that begins with this magical, magical, with this fantastic description of who Christ is, where it says he is the firstborn over all creation. In him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. All things have been created through him and for him. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. In Colossians chapter 1. It seems clear to me that Paul's understanding of reconciliation is for all created beings. So when he asks Philemon to take Onesimus back as a brother in Christ, he's inviting us to take seriously our call to live into the reconciliation of God that goes beyond second chances, beyond legalistic or cultural responses, or beyond even restoration to how things work. God's reconciliation invites us to live into the world as God creates it to be. Whole, restored, renewed for all people and all of creation for all time. How then might we be active participants in God's reconciling love in the world? Again, Philemon is addressed not just to an individual, but to a small group of people who worship together and who live and, and, and are a Christian community together. So the letter addresses not just us as individuals, but as a household. How do we together offer reconciliation in the world? in our community, in our local communities, in our families, both in terms of the way in which we interact with one another, and the way in which we interact with our community around us, and the way in which we interact with all of creation. May God's Spirit challenge and prompt us as we continue to serve God in the world today. Let's pray. Reconciling God, you call us to participate in your reconciling work in the world. In Christ, you call us to restore relationships, to fellowship with each other and with all peoples, to restore relationships and fellowship with all of creation. Challenge us to see those areas of our lives that are marked by broken relationships. Prompt and encourage us to seek reconciliation in you, no matter how hard or costly, that we may together be signs, foretastes of the world that you have created. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.